welcome. You have, most of you have seen me already once. Uh, I start with something slightly interactive. Would ask you now to raise hands who feels like you could read that. Please. Microphone is not on? I. That's fine, you should be able to read it. Okay, who would be able to read that? Um, which is kind of um, experiment showing that images are text. Um, because images, these two uh, examples, uh, understanding depends not on if they are image or not image, it depends on our ability to understand the symbols designed on this text. So to trace the, the distinction between background and foreground and do all this kind of stuff. And um, by this, the question arises, can images be an addition? And I added the scholarly addition to make it a bit more uh, clear, because the first idea would be, yes, of course, everything which is public, a text is made, which is made public is an addition, because we have the uh, etymology, etymology of either the putting something out, giving it to the, pub or to, to the public. But of course, there are lots of uh, arguments why it's not a digital addition, a scholarly addition. The scholarly effort in creating um, images is probably not that big. You can, could consider that, but okay, there are machines already doing it, there are robots doing it. Um, so, yeah, probably not that much in, um, uh, engagement, scholarly engagement. And um, there is this, um, it's unclear, at least for any machine, and maybe even for some readers, where is the uh, the demarcation, the limits, the uh, relationship between what is information on this image and what is just noise around. Usually, usually translated in this, oh, I need my full text of the image. That's the usual term for information, symbolic representation of the text. So, pure images are probably not an addition. I still would argue that they are, can be a crucial part in addition, and that's what I want to make clear in this presentation, um, that the um, idea of the addition, of the scholarly addition, can be independent of a full text transcription. Uh, that's kind of statement and something we will discuss. Um, it's not a demonstration of a new technology. It's not a, a mathematical proof of something. What is suggestion? Um, it's strongly framed by one theoretical model I personally like very much. I hope most of you have seen this already. Um, once or presented by Patrick himself or by somebody else. Patrick's artist text wheel in which he tries to um, make uh, us um, aware that uh, texts ha can have so many facets that it's not worth to reduce it to one perspective. So, making it a pluralistic model. And in this pluralistic model, there are lots of things which is easy to convey to every uh, scholarly editor. That's the lower part and the right part. So to say, okay, there's a, a text I transcribe, a linguistic uh, framework where I have multiple um, textual witnesses. I have to reconcile them and have to align them to each other and get to the, the, the one text or have a lot of a series of texts which all represent, are related to the one text, etc., etc., that they have a physical document. There was lots of effort in civil scholarly edition, editing to uh, make this digitally conceivable as much as possible, etc. And he tells, um, he uh, points to two dimensions which are easily connected to the idea of the text as a physical document to say, okay, if you have a physical document, you can look at it. And when you look at it, it has specific features like uh, 
layout. Um, there are uh, in, um, uh, miniatures on it, images on it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they, we have to perceive the text as well as something visual. And on the other uh, way around, if you come from the right side up to the top, it's easy to understand, okay, if I have a, my, my linguistic code, that's a code we would try to understand, which creates meaning, you know, meaning junkies. Um, and by this, there is a kind of a layer of meaning of interpretation of propositions we see in this text. If you have, you have these two directions, usually you feel comfortable. If you put them close together, you feel less comfortable. Most of the people I'm talking about, the text wheel, um, I try to avoid the step from the upper left corner to the upper corner. But um, when we consider this framework, when we consider this idea, uh, the, uh, the experience that images could be text, I would argue it's possible and it's sensible to plan for editions which combine only these two perspectives. These two perspectives in reality are already used and combined in environment, environments which nobody calls a digital a scholarly edition, um, but which um, are close to what we might want to have. That's an a uh, screenshot from an archival site where the archivists in Bolton in southern Tyrolia um, put images of, um, um, uh, of the uh, record, uh, their records of the uh, city council together with some deep descriptions, even structured data, who is, when it did it happen, who was uh, present and stuff like this. Um, and by this, conveying information on the, if, uh, on the text on the right side without transcribing it. Um, that's a similar, no, that's a different example where it uh, happens as well. It's a tool um, developed by a team in Poland um, um, who are really experts in uh, GIS systems, so they're experts in top, uh, topologies and building a system they call Indexer where they um, help the user to align textual fragments with a database. And the database, in this case, on uh, text, where you have places um, where the text was levied, and you want to have this kind of database relating, um, uh, relating the places to the text. The third one is something which should make it clear that it's not, not only something for the historians, uh, not for the archivists. So the archivists which create, uh, uh, create uh, images and where it's easy to publish things by simple images so they feel comfortable with, with this. But here we have the case where the original is lost. We have just the, the, um, uh, the images left and the historians create a data database out of the people um, who were pilgrims to Rome in the 18th, uh, 19th century, uh, these records, um, and made a database, a somewhat prosopographical database out of it, combining it with the image of the very text. Um, the project I'm involved in, which um, has a similar approach, developed a similar approach, um, is this one. The records of the imperial diet of, uh, in the uh, 1576, um, as it is an uh, edition um, trying to transform a long history of printed editions, um, we started with, okay, we uh, have to transcribe things. But uh, we realized, we knew in advance, we could not ever, never cover the full range of documents which are related. So we start to think about how can we convey information on the text which were uh, 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 on the older editions excluded from the edition at all. Nobody really knew about them. Um, and decided to collect um, deep descriptions of the archival records. And later on, that's the funny thing about it, thought, well, yes, um, when, if we have deep descriptions, why not add the images to get the text to this? description. So we have finally at the end of the project 
um, something where we combine um, these images provided by the archives with deep descriptions where we um, uh, describe the content of the piece, where we have some basic structural information on it of the text genre and uh, status in, in uh, creation and stuff like this. So it exists. And I failed several minutes ago in talking already about the non-historians when I was still in the historian world, but non-historians think about that as well. Um, Christopher Flueller did once a talk in uh, the Schoenberg Institute where he talked about, okay, how is the deep description which um, what uh, the, the manuscript description includes, where there's lots of intellectual work in it, in identifying the, the texts, um, collecting information on the history of the manuscripts, etc., etc. Um, is this related to critical editions? And if you see this deep description here, where there's lots of information, even on the philological point of view, the work is described, the context of this work, um, and now that's from Ecolipsis, you know that there are images to it. No problem to read the text. You have the link on the folio. So, it exists, this combination, upper left corner, it's perfect service, text read. How to call it? I'm citing here Kenneth Price, um, from his 2009 paper, where he tried to give an overview why people call their digital publications um, of literary and historical texts in a specific way. Um, what I'm doing you have here now in this graph is different from what he describes. Because that's the usual perception which most of the editors do. Okay, I have my transcription, and there's in uh, Patrick's work, in uh, Piazza's work, lots of examples where they say, okay, and then there are several steps in which we transform this, uh, the, the, the original through a uh, reproduction, step by step, into an edition, a really full blown edition. Kenneth Price was less polarizing, but giving a lot of variants of perspective on this how to call it, and um, it's describing that they might have different, um, uh, highlight different um, uh, features of the, at least what, uh, this digital publication. And um, the others, sev several of the others down there in the long list, von Hülle, um, uh, Eggert, uh, Rod Dillon, um, returned back to this polarized perspective, saying, okay, there's one side, the archival perspective, I, collecting material and by chance inserting some transcriptions and by this I'm not really feel comfortable calling in an edition or I have a work to edit a text um, but to which I add lots of documentation and, and by this I, I feel like it's not a standard edition but an edition, archival edition. And the first two on this list uh, Marek Swan and Ivan Klavacek are uh, papers which, well, helped me to define uh, what I, from the name, I derived because Ivan Klavacek uh, suggested this name in the footnote. He's a very traditional uh, historical a serious scientist, so working with originals in the archives is his, his life. And Mike Swan um, published it in a, well, a paper on, I have a special problem in an edition, a regional uh, book of a city and in a volume nobody, uh, well, apart those present at the conference, probably ever read, um, in German, and etc. So uh, these two are somehow those who should have given the paper. Um, here, because they somehow invented this. I'm only using their ideas and names. Well, I had the same ideas and read, read their papers later on. Um, so, the point is, um, I'm calling it proto-edition. And now the question arises a bit how proto is the proto-edition. And I'm a bit unsure. Uh, it's easy if we uh, continue in this polarized perspective. We can say, okay, there are steps. And one of the steps could be to say we have in this process of the digital edition, um, we have the image, and then we do one step, and we can do uh, several other steps. But as this description, the content description, 
is not defined by um, the need of all the intermediate steps, I would say no. It's not necessarily only a step. There are several things where we can make, try to delineate the proto edition. Um, for example, this one is a an archival information system with an image. You could say, okay, that's one of those examples uh, you produced at the beginning. I'm tempted to say, no, that's not a proto edition. Because even if the image is there, even if there is description there, what it lacks is considering the description as something which is structured information. It's just a text, descriptive text. And if you read this, you will find lots of um, cases where you say, okay, that's just dumping all description into one field, not caring about um, the, the uh, semantic context. And last point in this demarcation and this uh, finding the borders of the proto edition would be, um, well, yeah, if there, uh, isn't this a problem we don't have anymore? Because our real proto edition is the proto edition where people use the images, put them into artificial intelligence systems, and produce by this an edition. Um, that's something Dominic Sitzmann called um, artificial edition. Never have, has printed this, and probably somebody else has done as well, and, as these uh, labels are, at the IMC in 2019. Um, so, saying, okay, we have HDR, we have um, name entity recognition, we can do, some of you might have already done, used uh, large language models to insert annotations, um, structural annotations into text. So, all the things humans did um, could uh, do the machine, so they are all somehow proto editions. Uh, they are not an edition, of course, because the, the outcome is dependent on the quality of the, the algorithms we involve. Okay. So they are proto edition. Um, they might be not that good in contextualization as um, humans are. By maybe simply lacking access to this information. Okay, a proto edition. Um, I think still there is a distinction to why my um, rectangle on the upper left corner of the text wheel, and that's an for me, important point uh, on what I currently call proto edition that the proto edition is cares about the meaning of the text. It tries to convey this meaning as machine readable, as digitally available, as uh, detailed as possible without transcribing. And that's the main difference. So, I conclude. The proto editions, for me, and to suggest this, and I'm curious what you think about this, and how many other terms you suggest for the same thing, um, is first thing that we accept that a text can be conveyed by an image of the text, that we ex accept that we can do scholarly work on a text without transcribing it, representing it in a structured way, deep description. Um, and by this, it's probably a close cousin to the uh, artificial edition, as it accepts that lots of things we are accustomed as a standard humanistic approach in the non-digital world are different in the digital world, but it's just a cousin, not the same thing. Thank you. <laughs>